So um, the title actually has an inequality in it. It's the power of community. A MOOC is bigger than a tech digital textbook, and that's what I'm going to try to argue. And uh, I'm a physicist, a Duke. I'm not an ed specialist in education. None of what I say is data-based. I didn't or have not yet undertaken any serious study. Um, but for what it's worth, I've been teaching for 20 years, and I really like teaching. And so when I was offered the opportunity to teach a MOOC, I hesitated a lot because the reason I like teaching is because I think there's this really great connection you can form with students, and I didn't imagine that the platform would support it. What I want to argue is, A, that it does, and B, that I don't think we're paying enough attention to that aspect. Um, so I'm going to go th ignore most of what's in the slides because you all know all these things. Um, but the, the thesis I want to state is, we heard this this morning, learning is hard. You want students to put in a lot of effort, and all the stuff in green is taken from the discussion forums for one of the MOOCs I taught in astronomy, and it, people describing you know, losing their families for this. It's hard work. The question is, how do you get students to put in the effort that you want them to put in in order to make them learn? And at, in my anecdotal experience, MOOC and otherwise, the only way to do that is to get a social interaction do going, the thing that motivates people. I don't know. I don't think it's money. I think it's social interactions is how we work. And so the, the challenge in MOOCs is, I think, to systematize what anecdotally I figured out uh, is how to get a, a community or a social interaction going. And the point and the, that I think is being a little bit uh, ignored is the fact that in a MOOC, you have a community of students. There's a large, diverse uh, bunch of students doing the same work, and they can collaborate. Um, and this community interaction can be an essential part of learning. Uh, what you can generate is a situation where the students bond. There's a uh, true group uh, work going on, both with the instructor and with the students. And I assert that in some sense, a MOOC has an advantage over a college class, having taught both, because on the forum, discussion forums of a MOOC, there's a sort of relative uh, controlled level of anonymity. A student can be as familiar or as unfamiliar to the peers as they want to be. And uh, this allows people to be very free about, I don't get this. Can you help me? Can you understand? And I think that this is the way that a MOOC is not a textbook. In brief, what do I think that other of the things we did facilitated this? One is, and contrary to what everybody here has been saying, the homework assignments were open-ended, although quantitative, and very difficult. They took hours to complete. They forced students to collaborate. We spent a lot of time being part of the class, uh, about 2,000 forum posts by the staff in the first iteration. We did things like Google Hangouts so that they saw each other's faces and our own. And I think that thinking about how to, and we very carefully designed the forums to keep the students on target. And I think that thinking in those directions uh, can make a qualitative difference in how much you, you and your students get out of the MOOC. It also, as an anecdote, makes it a lot more rewarding to teach a MOOC if you're not thinking that you're writing a textbook. Thank you. to Jackie then. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jun Jie Liu. I'm from HarvardX. Uh, my topic is formative development. How do we improve the course every week? So a little background information about the course I'm running. ChinaX is a MOOC about Chinese history offered by HarvardX. It's a s series of 10 mini courses, and each of which last for four to eight weeks. So altogether, we have 50 weeks of contents. And this course lasts from 2013 to 2015. And we are very fortunate to be able to experiment a, a lot of different pedagogies and technologies in this course. So it will be extremely crucial for us to know which works well, which doesn't work well. So we can decide what, what will happen the next week. And we launch the course every Thursday. In the following Wednesday, we release an office hours video so the professors can talk to students what happened in the past week and what will happen in the next week. 
So in order to quickly apply what we learned in the past week, we need to do a quick analysis within a couple of days. We'll look at certain metrics like the participation and performance, the number of active learners, and their assessment results. We'll also create an inviting environment for them to give us their feedbacks. We have course and survey, weekly survey. We ask them very specific questions about their feelings about each component of the course. We also um, use different approaches to analyze them. We use word cloud, we use topic modeling to analyze those kind of data. And we also give them the opportunity to make decisions. We ask them, do you want to watch Harvard College students to discuss the same questions? If you want, we can include them. Do you want to hear this guest professor again? If you want, we can invite them back. Something like that. So they feel they kind of have an ownership of this course. Besides that, we also have other feedback channels like email, social media, and other discussion forums. So after we make the decision in a quick fashion, we announce them in the office hours very explicitly what works well, what doesn't work that well, what we will do in the future. We also tell them in the weekly email, in social media, et cetera. So after we change the strategy, we will compare the new week with the past week to see whether there's any improvement or not. Because of the quick, the short time, so we have to make every decision in analysis, analysis very quickly. So that's the gist of this kind of uh, development. Thank you. Where's my slide? Yeah. Okay, I'm Jeff Challen, um, professor of computer science at uh, University of Buffalo, and this is a collaboration with Margot Seltzer, who's way in the back from Harvard. Um, and I'm here because I've been using MOOC type technologies in my own classroom to solve some problems. I'm not an educational expert. I'm a domain scientist. Um, but I'm also here uh, with, a, with a warning about sort of how MOOCs are perceived at other institutions, right? So if you're at Harvard or at Duke, right, here is what MOOCs seem like to you, right? Like this is the future of this exalted uh, you know, new world that we're all going to be living in. Uh, unfortunately, if you're at a middle tier institution, much less, you know, a lower tier institution at community college, sometimes MOOCs look a little <laughs> bit more like this, right? And I don't know if you can see on this picture, but if you look really carefully, there's <laughs> San Jose State, right? Um, and so I, and this, is a, this is a reality, and the question is, what are people afraid of, right? And I think to some degree, what people like me and people at other universities are afraid of is what I'm going to call the single authored syndication model of how MOOCs are going to be distributed in the future, right? So in this model, there, uh, there's a course developed at top tier school. If you look at the edX contributors, they're almost all drawn from top 100 universities. In fact, they're all drawn from top 100 universities and colleges. Um, so it's developed by, by a single person. I just looked. I didn't get through all 200 AgriX courses, but of my sample, about 87% uh, of them had one staff person. So they're really being dissolved by a single person. Here it's Margo, who's a fantastic teacher, by the way. She taught me operating systems, so not, not a bad person to do it. But then this course is now replicated at a bunch of other institutions, right, where people like me essentially become almost a glorified TA, right? I show up, I hit play, right, and I'm in charge of sort of, you know, proctoring the exams and making sure nobody cheats and grading homework and things like this, right? But I don't have a lot of ability to contribute to the content or to modify it to meet my needs, right? And even if you like the sort of apple, you know, the, the uh, you know, apocalypse, I can't say the word anyway. If you even if you like the future of universities that this model would sort of produce, there's some questions about how effective it would be for learning, right? So the two questions are prompted by uh, problems with you know this sort of model, right? The one is. You know, edX you know, advertises this as great courses by the world's best universities, but what are these universities the best at, right? I'm at a research one university that's not top tier, and I still get very, very little reinforcement about teaching. It's almost all research, and I think that's even more true at places like Harvard and MIT, right? So are these people the best teachers in the country? Could we uh, work together and do a better job? The second thing is that the students at these schools are obviously not like the students everywhere else, right? I see Harvard students as sort of like the special forces of learning, right? You drop them into a course with very little support, and they will do the job and get it done, and, and that's just how they are, right? They're really, really good at it. So so anything that works at Harvard, it's not necessarily going to work for my students, right? So I'm almost out of time, but let me try to tell you what we're trying to do. We're trying to build a collaborative MOOC platform that would enable multiple collaborators to contribute a lot of content into the system that would be mostly overlapping at first because we all have our own courses. Uh, we want this to be deployed at multiple different kinds of institutions. And we want, over time, to engage a growing community of other instructors at other places who are teaching similar courses. 
Um, eventually, what's kind of cool about this is that we can specialize. People can focus on things that they're good at. I can focus on teaching the parts of the class that I'm good at, like maybe one or two things, and Margot can teach other stuff. Um, and so this is the goal of our approach, and our idea is to use modularity. Thank you. All right, um, I'm not gonna be able to see you, which is probably better. Um, so hi, I'm Anne from NovoEd. Um, uh, NovoEd is a startup out of Stanford um, that it focuses on team building and social collaboration. It's a social learning platform. Um, my personal history, I was at Coursera in 2012 when we had four partners, and before that, I taught at Stanford's online high school, and before that, Stanford's education program for gifted youth, so I have been around the block. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, a series of courses, a survey I did of eight different courses, and the engagement rates that we're seeing. Um, so just there's an article about it that you can look at. Um, first thing, how do we define engagement? So the idea of engagement of everyone registering for a course for over or under the number of people who completed it seems kind of ludicrous. So what we do is we measure people who admit themselves to the course by completing the first assignment. That's the denominator. Over that, we put the numerator of people who complete rigorous grading criteria. Now, most of the assignments on our platform are open-ended. They're peer-reviewed. And so I surveyed eight courses that had engagement rates between 33 and 63 percent. So 33 to 63 percent of people who completed their first assignment finished and got a statement of completion as set out by uh, instructors mostly from elite institutions. <laughs> the courses were in topics like creativity, design thinking, entrepreneurship one and two, decision quality. We had a course in Spanish on uh, strategic decision making, mobile health, and developmental math, which was deployed, um, is gonna be moved into community college classrooms soon. Um, I'm sure we'll have lots to talk about. There are um, many elements uh, that go into uh, these, the commonalities for engagement. Um, they fall into three buckets. Uh, one is multiple opportunities for collaboration. So teamwork, team projects, team workspace, sending students back into other students' work. So all student work is visible on the platform. When the assignment submission stops, everybody sees everything. We send them back, have them comment on things. Um, cohesion of project-based assignments. You look at the assignment list, a student sees that the steps, assignment one builds into assignment two, the final project is something that's valuable to them as a real-world context, project-based learning, and then three, formation of a learning community. So these two, help, these other two elements help with that. We also talk about instructor presence, profiles. We have active student profiles that reflect student activity in the class. It's not just their bio, it's how many peer reviews they've done, what's been recognized is helpful, whether their forum posts have been voted up, they have a reputation score, their uh, assignments are visible on their profile. These all go into formation of a learning community. We're seeing this across disciplines and consistently replicated even as we repeat these classes and the instructor is much less involved. We see the focus really going to the students and they're becoming the engine that make these classes move forward. And if you'd like to read more about it, there's a paper um, right there. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Kevin Lynch from Colgate University. Um, last summer, we started uh, looking into MOOCs and trying to understand if there was a role for MOOCs in a small liberal arts residential college. And we decided the best way to find out was just to go for it. So. Uh, in November, we downloaded Open edX. In December, we started putting content up there. The first week of January, we recorded, got this 20 hours of video. We learned now that that was too much, but live and learn. Um, and we did this for a course called the Advent of the Atomic Bomb. This is part of our, part of our core program at Colgate, which is really signature to our uh, university. Um, scientific perspective. So this course looked at the development of the atomic weapon and the historical context around that. Um, it's co-taught by Professor Karen Harp, who's a geologist, and uh, Colonel Willie, who is a chief docent at the Air and Space Museum, brings a lot of knowledge, actually helped the Enola Gay restoration project. 
So we did these video lectures, and then one of the goals we want to do with this course is, um, Karen is very concerned that 19, 20, and 21 old students don't have a lot of perspective on the Cold War, on nuclear development. So how can we bring alumni in to help form, inform their perspectives? So what we did is we launched um, Open edX as a private course, but we marketed it to our alumni. We got about 500 alumni who agreed to participate. And we put it out there as help us experiment with this technology and see where it fits into the type of education that Colgate provides. Um, and, and the alumni were very eager to do that. So we used a variety of things. We did a, um, a Twitter play where over the course of five weeks, we, act, we had the five years of World War II. We had alumni and students play different historical characters. And they really got into it. Some of the students, in fact, one of the students continued to tweet in character up through graduation. So graduation morning was still tweeting in character about the, uh, the events of the war. Um, we did discussion boards. And as you can see, it's kind of hard to see on the slide. But conversations between alumni and students were interleaved. So the students, 24 of them, were in a regular credit-bearing class. And then these 500 alumni took this online course. But they were completely fused together. Hence, we called it a fusion course. We couldn't think of a different name for it. We did a crowdsourced timeline. Um, we weren't sure how effective that was going to be. We have over 400 entries on that. And it's, it's, it's amazing the, the, the depth of detail that was put on there. And that was done with a simple Google form. So it was really easy for students and alumni to put items on that. Um, and again, Open edX powered it all. So there wasn't a huge investment on our part. Really, it was about time. We used resources we already had on hand. Um, what we learned from it was our older alums were much more engaged in the forums, which we were surprised. We thought it would be the younger alums. But it turns out a lot of the younger alums took the course because they weren't able to while they were at Colgate. The course has been offered for about 10 years. Um, and just to give you an idea, with the 24 students, there's 40 on the wait list. So it's a very popular course. So we're finding a lot of alums, this is an opportunity. And that's really key because young alumni is a tough group to engage. And this is a great way to engage our young alumni and keep them tied in. And I'd be glad to answer any more questions on it. Thanks. Jackie? Got your slide here somewhere. Okay, oh, you just there you go. It. Okay, so in this presentation, we're assuming that the variables on the right are should be raised, should be increased. We're also assuming that participation, retention, and completion actually contribute to learning. That probably hasn't been proved. Um, and the methodology that we're experimenting with at Open Doors Group is to ask the participants, either as individuals, as small teams, or as the entire class, to produce something of value, a service or a product or an object, and preferably something with some commercial value. We're also assuming, or at least hoping, that organizations like Open Doors Group and similar ones with no taxes and no grants can actually produce affordable MOOCs uh, without, with, and, and do it without having to all of us mortgage our houses, OK? Um, so we, are, we have three experiments, two we've done, when we're planning. The first experiment was two small MOOCs that we created in late 2013, last year. The first was called Rapid Book Publishing for Educators. It attracted 800 people. The second one was called Project Management Skills for All Careers. We sold it out at 2,000 students. Both were free courses on canvas.net. In the rapid book publishing course, all 800 students as a group chose a topic, wrote a book, and published it during the four weeks. And in the project management class, there was nothing produced. So in a way, it was a control group. The things that were similar, they were both free courses on canvas.net. The average or the most common education level was a master's degree. But there were a lot of other demographic differences. And of course, the subject was different which could have contributed to the results. And the results were that participation, retention, and completion were much higher in the educators in the book publishing course. So um, we also think from another experiment that I don't have time to talk about, that small groups are better than whole class or individual. Certainly participation, if you mean participating with other students, is higher. So we're switching from Canvas, which we love, to NovoEd, which we also love, because NovoEd has these small group capabilities. And so we will have the jury still out on whether that's going to work or not. But I would be happy to share the demographics and the results from the, from the experiment I discussed. My, my email address is jackie.hood at opendoorsgroup.org. Thank you.
Thank you. Well, can we have all of our panellists uh, up here? Um, I got a couple of things uh, out of that that I might just throw out there to um, maybe start some uh, thinking about some questions. And, and one is the importance of uh, when designing a MOOC to not only design the content and the structure of the course, but actually design how the course gets orchestrated when it's run. A number of these presentations were really about the orchestration of the course and how that affects the students. Um, the other thing that I, I pulled out is uh, collaborative design, uh, moving away from the single academic um, designing a course to collaborative teams, whether they be multiple academics or academics in conjunction with dedicated learning designers or media people uh, or additional domain experts. So, there was a couple of things there. Any questions? We've got a couple of microphones running around. Oh, there's one right up at the back. So, my job is to make the people in the aisle run a lot. Um, and this is sort of a shameless plug, so um, I'm Jeffrey's collaborator. And I guess I'd be curious, the rest of you who clearly have experimented in lots of spaces, does this concept of cooperative MOOC development and collaboration and modularity actually resonate with anyone? Does it sound completely you know, impossible? I would just be really interested in getting other people's reactions. Anyone? Well, we've linked classrooms. And, um, and, and that, so that's linking students. It's not quite, I think, what you're, you're thinking about, because you're going to have different teachers adding content, but, but we've, we've done that, we've had partners who've done that, where they've linked classrooms in different countries, specifically one in China and one in the US, um, and so each had their own instructor, but then the students worked on shared projects, um, and, uh, and, it, and it worked, but it worked in part because the students can form their own community and see each other and see their activity within the environment. Yeah, I would say we're um, actually working on a course for this spring, um, potentially on the edX platform, but we're not positive yet. Uh, we have a professor at Colgate and a professor at St. Lawrence who both teach course on the Vietnam War. Uh, the professor at Colgate takes it from a political bend, and the professor at St. Lawrence takes it more from a sociological perspective. And um, we're going to bring those two classes together via a MOOC-like thing, but that idea had a, two different perspectives on the same event from two different faculty at two different campuses, and we're going to build it, and that's actually being funded by uh, Teagle, so we're excited about that. So I haven't done any of these collaborations, but I did sort of try to, to play the role of the second picture in the, the beautiful uh, talk there. By having finished teaching a MOOC, I sort of had a friend who was running a MOOC, and I sort of played the TA at Duke. And uh, I learned a lot from that. And, and you know, two string theorists teaching a physics class is a lot of ego. I, yeah, I think that modularity and collaboration are, are probably the way this is going to work. And uh, I think that, that in, in view of the talks from yesterday, a lot of really open platform, open source classes, rather than if we manage to get away from these closed platforms, will basically make that happen because people will take and modify and that'll make it a natural sort of evolutionary thing. And I think that's what's going to happen, I hope. Uh, so for ChinaX, we have more than 20 uh, guest professors. So we try to give learners different perspectives by letting uh, multiple professors talking about the same topic. Another thing about, unique thing about ChinaX is we have large amount of learners in China we have uh, 6,000 learners from China. So there's a big language barriers for them to understand the course. So we have a lot of China, Chinese local partners. They help us translate the course into Chinese. They put their videos into China because YouTube was banned there. And they did a lot of localization. They found offline discussion groups, something like that. So we try to cater to different kind, kind of learners in different conditions. Uh, so my own experience at uh, UQX, out of our first eight courses, we've only had one course that's been a single academic course. Um, and uh, also the process that we kind of force our uh, course teams to go through includes collaborative workshops 
where the, the, the course streams that are, the courses that are being prepared in parallel, which are from totally different uh, domains, uh, are in the workshop together and they have to critique their own, each other's designs. And we've actually had very good feedback from the uh, course teams that this kind of collaborative uh, critiquing and uh, comparing what other people are planning to do in their MOOCs really helps them. So, next question. Uh, Doug Fisher, Vanderbilt University. So, I was going to ask the question that I think was asked about uh, modularity and, and get more into it, but as someone who's used MOOCs in my on-campus courses for since, I don't know, a couple of years, two and a half years now, um, you know, teaching collaborations are probably the most exciting thing to me about this space. For 25 years, I was a lone wolf when I walked into my class. It was just me. And it was very unlike the research environment, which was very collaborative and community oriented. So I'm pretty excited about hearing about some of those plans. I guess I would ask more generally about other possibilities for teaching collaborations. And I think as, a, as something we should measure um, is uh, instructor outcomes as well as student outcomes. And one instructor outcome that I think is pretty common is if you are using the content of others, you start creating content yourself. And um, that is not part of the, the research agenda I've heard about. So I'd be curious to know, those of us that have used the content of others, how often uh, do you actually create your own content to specialize your course in some way? Or have you at least thought about it? And is that an outcome? Or are there other outcomes we ought to measure of instructors who are doing this kind of thing? So I think that, at least for me, I mean, part of my interest in the space came out of actually trying to, you know, so uh, the, the reason I'm a computer scientist be, is really because I took Margot's class when I was at Harvard, right? And so when I started at UB, I was very excited about trying to teach that class there. And it was just impossible, though, in its present form, right? I mean, it's way, you know, Margot would have, I don't know, I'm probably going to exaggerate slightly, but like four or five teaching assistants for a class of maybe 30 students, right? You know, I walk in on the first day, I've got 100 students and two teaching assistants that have no idea what they're doing, right? And so sort of dealing with, with that sort of forced me to develop a lot of the automation tools that people have thought about, right? But I think what I, I find exciting about the idea of collaboration, too, and I tried to get out, I, I was rushing, you know, quite badly at the end of the talk, is this idea that, that once you build some trust and once you build a group of people that are willing to use each other's content, and, and first of all, that also provides a way to evaluate your own, your own modules, your own content, right? How effectively do I teach something, right? I don't know, my students don't know, right? Because they're stuck with me and they have no alternative, right? But if they could watch you know, both me and then Margo and then several other people explain the same idea, right? And then we can look downstream and see how they do on an assessment that follows that, then we have some hard data about who's, who's working, right? And then they don't have to watch me teach that thing anymore because clearly I'm terrible at it, right? Or, but the nice thing is over time that also allows the instructors that are involved to stop having to curate an entire course, right? And try to contribute either new content, try to improve parts of the class that aren't working, right? So I think, you know, your idea of a research collaboration is, is a great model, right? Um, but I would also point out that I think that like a lot of research collaborations, one thing that worries me a little bit about the book movement is this obsession with massive scale in these massive platforms and abused all over the place, right? I mean, most research collaboration occurs between a handful of people, right, who are really focused on one particular problem. There's, you know, trust. There's relationships that are built up, right? It's not this big anonymous thing where I go online and I download a course from someone I've never met and don't know anything about, right? And really don't have any way to contribute to either, so. So our classes are, are created by a lot of people at the same time. Um, I was really impressed. There's an OER class out of State University of New York that was, had 17 instructors. I thought just doing that was an exercise in, in some kind of brilliant coordination. But we typically have about 10 or 12 people. And because we're, we're advocates of open educational resources, we started in the project management course with a book by Mary Barron and Andrew Barron at Rice University called Project Management for in Scientists and Engineers. We, wanted, we had to tailor it to un have people understand that business owners and teachers and nurses and other people also use project management skills in their career. So we added a whole first section. And Mary Barron came back and said, gosh, I wish I'd thought of having this section you have on intercultural communication that we added to the book. 
And then we, of course, republish the book and so on. So I think if you have, if you have an OER mindset, you're going to be able to farm the, the OER that's out there at, on connections and other so sources, and then you will feel an obligation to put back in there as well. Hi, so my name is Ed Kutrell, and I work for Microsoft Research in Bangalore, in India. And some of the stuff that we're working on is trying to see how we can use online resources in sort of fourth tier colleges in, in India. And so this notion of the smoking ruins um, compared to the gorgeous uh, thing is something that I feel very acutely. Um, but the notion of this, this fusion or sort of like mixing all kinds of different resources is something that's very important for us in the way that we work because what we're doing is something that is supplemental to existing colleges. So the colleges, you're taking a course and then we're trying to help the fact that the, you know, the teachers in many cases have, they're just out of college themselves, have no teaching experience. And so we're trying to both prov provide models but also something that matches the curriculum of those colleges. And you can't do that with just taking a course from edX or Coursera. You really have to mix and match lots of small little units in order to appropriately match that. And so I just want to emphatically uh, reinforce this notion of this kind of model, because that seems to be what's really working for us. And I'd like to, to encourage you all to also think about the ways in which the work that you're doing can be applied in those kinds of contexts. So I, I want to mention we um, are in the process of rolling out to about 250 community college classrooms, the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching Math courses, the Pathways courses that Susan mentioned the other morning. Um, and we're running up against this, right? So, you know, how do you not train, because I don't like that word, but how do you help community college instructors use a, a a technology that they can modify because the old technology that was just like here's the textbook right it's online and and now they have capability for modification but we, they don't necessarily know what to do so we're, we're stumbling along in the dark trying to help them figure out here's what you can do and I'm just letting you know that we're working on it and no conclusions because we're letting them tell us where to go and more next year <laughs> so next year I guess so uh, another thing that I've observed that might uh, help with the sharing and reuse is that uh, the, the number of short MOOCs seems to be increasing as, as well. So when MOOCs first started, a, a lot of them were you know, the full 13-week semester style courses, but now you're finding a lot of eight-week and even four-week courses starting to appear. And this means that you know, someone could use that just as a, a single section of uh, another course. Uh, quite easily. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, one, I've, I've loved being at this workshop because I, I don't know anything about this area, and so I'm finding all this sort of stuff out. And I was just at the se a session talking about an experiment where some community colleges nearby used some edX courses that were developed at MIT, and it was really exciting to hear that this was happening. But the courses they were given were locked down edX classes that they weren't allowed to modify the content of. And it was frustrating because you heard the instructors talking about a lot of work that they did to adapt the courses for their own students, right? Now, first of all, you know, I think a lot of people here, when they hear that, there's this idea, sadly, of sort of they're dumbing down the material, right? You know, and no, 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 that doesn't need to flow upwards to the MIT class, right? No way would a Bunker Hill Community College teacher know how to teach physics better than an MIT professor. That's just impossible, right? Um, and I think we need to get away from that because that's just not true, right? But then the fact that they had conducted this experiment in this weird way where they had given them this frozen version of the class, I, I find that very difficult to understand, right? It was a great idea, right? We need to encourage more collaborations between institutions that are in different categories, but it just seemed like it came with a lot of baggage, you know? So uh, I have a question for Kevin. I mean, it was really nice to hear about how you're integrating your alumni in your courses. Uh, can you talk a bit more about how you manage that interaction between alumni and students, especially if you have a lot of people contributing to the message boards and so on? Is there some kind of quality control? Do interactions get out of hand? Or was uh, not that yet. not the case? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this is the first course we've done that. Uh, we partnered with our alumni affairs office, so they did a lot of the marketing for us, as well as a lot of the um, back and forth, because some of our older alumni had some challenges getting the course signed up and things like that. 
Um, we, we're actually launching a course in two weeks here called Living Writers Online, which is a, a similar thing where we, uh, the on-campus will review 10 books over the semester, but on the uh, edX Edge site, we'll do four books. And that's open to alumni, friends, and the community. So we're going to have a larger pool there. And um, again, we're going to just kind of play it by year and see how it goes. I, I, we didn't have a lot of issues with that. I, actually, it was a very positive collaboration to the point we actually had, I believe, at least two alumni travel to campus to sit in on a class, which the instructor was very open to doing. So it, you know, I, I, kudos to the instructor. Uh, her and her uh, partner there from the Air and Space Museum were wonderful to work with, took a lot of input, and it was a very team effort. Um, so we haven't seen that issue yet. Um, that is a concern if we open to a, a true MOOC and it's the whole world, what is that? And that's one of the reasons that that particular course hasn't gone public yet, because um, it's a very controversial topic. Right. Another thing that came up, and Karen will be very honest about that, she's not an expert in atomic weapons. She's a geologist. She teaches this course because it's part of our core program. So she has some concerns, but she's also said that, you know, it's helped her be a better instructor and really look at the material she uses in those things. So. And can you talk a bit more about the community college and Carnegie? project that you just mentioned? Oh, and sure. So, um, so uh, the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching under uh, Tony Brake decided to address the community math, uh, college math problem. Uh, the, it was the courseware was on OLI, um, which was static and locked down. It was gorgeous. I, I mean, I played around in it to help redesign it. I have all good things to say about it. Um, they wanted to move to something that had more flexibility for instructors. They weren't sure what that was. Um, and so they chose us in part because of the social and collaborative features. In our initial rollout, we're not emphasizing team building or any of those things because, you, you know, I, I don't know if any of you have been in the position of being an instructor where two weeks before a course starts they, or class starts, they go, you're using this technology this semester. Translate everything, right? It sucks to be that person. Um, <laughs> and, and so we're very sensitive to that, you know, having that in mind. Um, what, what the focus of uh, my work with them really is, here are ways to encourage community using email, forums, you know, just things that you don't need to wrap your mind around, virtual team formation online and then across campuses, right? We'll get there. But the idea is that because of the core curriculum, which involves teaching math using productive persistent mindset intervention, productive struggle, a lot of peer-to-peer -peer interaction, peer work, and, um, and productive persistence messaging, continual messaging and encouraging, and improvement science is also data-driven science and analytics. We really need flexibility, and the platform allows for that. So it allows for constant iteration. And then one, uh, just a, a, a shout out, because the data people will like this. Um, so we're, they're gonna get it, Carney's gonna get a nightly dump of data to analyze what's happening, right? And then we're just, it's because it's so customizable, we can, they, we can make adjustments much more quickly, and then they can send out interventions to various classrooms, like, okay, you know what, everybody's failing, X. <laughs> but that's, that's pretty much where we are. Any more questions? Yeah. yeah, this is a question for China X. Um, so every week you invite professors to speak for short segments about China, and I was wondering, is there a formula to create engaging videos that students actually enjoy and watch the whole thing and you know, not get bored? Can you repeat your question? Is there a formula for creating engaging videos? Uh, yes. So we try different types of videos. Some videos are as long as 40 minutes long. Some videos are as short as two minutes long. So we try to cater. So sometimes professors have a storytelling style. Sometimes people are just reading from script. So we ask people, which one do you prefer? We divide people into several groups. And we ask them, which, one do you, which kind of video do you prefer? And also, we have some kind of videos that are uh, specifically designed for social media purpose. We have one video, one, one minute long video. It's about professors singing a song about Chinese dynasty that has gone viral in China. It has been watched by four million people in one week. So the professors are overnight celebrities in China now. And so we have different strategies for different kind of videos and to cater to the styles of the professors, the contents, and their specific learners. So in general though, what have you found that um, most people like? Uh, people have different tastes, but generally it depends on their contents and their per, uh, personal style. If it's a very difficult content, if the professors are kind of reading style, so mm -hmm. it might be better to have shorter videos. If it's very engaging video, it's okay to have 40 minutes long. Yeah. 
Thank you. Oh, sorry, I have another question. Um, so, and you mentioned that you get uh, student feedback every week, and then if they like the professor, you invite them back. Um, but often student feedback is very broad, you know, like critique my teaching style, and they're all like, it says something very broad that you can't apply specifically to um, how they teach. So I was wondering how you guys uh, kind of constructed your question for student feedbacks to get the most effective. Um, yeah, so we, we asked very specific questions about specific component of the course, like the video, the video lens, or the, the content, or the format of new technologies, because we have uh, included a lot of new technologies in the course, like dynamic map, the annotation tools, uh, different tools. So each week, we, when we launch a new technology, we ask them to describe their learning experience. We ask them to give us uh, suggestions and something like that. So we analyze those feedbacks in different ways, and then we decide whether we want to keep that technology or not, whether we want to reinforce that learning points or not. Thank you. I should say that uh, one of the things we've discovered in uh, UQX is that uh, uh, different academics have different talents in front of a camera. Um, and so when we're designing our, our courses now, we're having to, you know, do screen tests of the academics first to work out what sort of videos we're going to use because some of them require an audience to, to light up, some of them you put them in front of a camera and, and you'd think that they'd worked in the TV industry their whole life. Got another question down here in the front? So this is, this is about citation. And uh, we have a, a tradition of citing in research. We don't have a tradition of citing in education, so far as I can tell. I know the open movement is very much into acknowledgment. Um, should we, so that people in academia start taking uh, the teaching products that we produce seriously as, as intellectual output, um, and because this stuff is public facing, I sense that there is going to be an increased need to cite openly. Um, I'm waiting for the time when a MOOC instructor uses somebody else's homework exercise, doesn't acknowledge, and gets hammered on the discussion forums for plagiarism, um, something we want to avoid. Should we, in the open movement, I can specify how I would like it cited, should we as a group start thinking about standardizing uh, a method of citation and citing um, educational output so that academics do start taking it seriously? Well, I, I've thought about this um, but, uh, based on actually a conversation um, a few, well, almost a year ago now with the Teaching Learning Center at Stanford, um, which started doing case studies of courses. And if you go to their Teaching Commons site, you can see case studies. I started writing case studies of some of our MOOCs and designs, mostly just for note-taking purposes for myself. And then it became useful because when someone, a professor would come and say, hey, I want to do these kinds of things, I could just send off they're pretty boring, but you know, just send off, like here's some case studies that, that you talk about the pedagogical strategies. Um, I bring those up because they've been useful to me, and I think that if that became some kind of practice, I don't know if that's something that would be cited, but at least there's a way to kind of track design change and, and um, evolution, and then people can measure it. Well, we, we use standard bibliographical citation format. Um, and in our current class, when I wrote the style guide, I, the long ones, are, they're too long. You go to Chicago school or something, and it goes on for pages and pages. I found one called How to Write Your Term Paper that's written for 10th graders. And it's simple, and it includes all the standard. Here's how to cite a book. Here's how to cite a magazine article, journal, and here's how to cite internet content. And we also, there's a Stanford guidelines for intellectual property that we use that talks about how to just uh, site to include links in your class because as Stanford says it's usually legal to just jump to a link it may rot on you and you have to check it every term but but there's still an etiquette about it in terms of you should be citing it with the name of the link not you know putting up a dumb picture and then having a link behind it that has nothing to do with that picture and you should also cite at the top level of the of the website and then tell people how to get down to the level that you're talking about because if that, if for example, if that website is advertising supported, it's not fair to jump down to the bottom because then you're killing the sustainability of that website. So, so there's both 
legal and etiquette, and I think we should observe them just like people in, in publishing do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like the idea of, of attribution. I think the question is how do we, um, how do we make it useful, right? Because I'm, I'm not sure that I really, um, I think there's something different about the types of citation, and really it's frequently downright plagiarism that people do in their classes, right? I mean, this is sort of the, the, the classic way that young faculty develop a new course, right? Which is they don't, right? They take their advisor's class and they copy it, right? And they copy the slides, they copy the assignments, right? Um, and a lot of times, you know, the last slide, it'll always say these slides were originally from here, right? And, and to some degree, you know, that, that seems like it's not something that, that uh, as academics, we're particularly uncomfortable with. What I worry more is how do we build that into a system that allows things to change and allows people to fix mistakes and allows, rather than having a tree where, you know, somebody's conceptual mistake about how to teach a particular concept is now replicated over and over and over by every generation of, of students and their students, right? Until you have whole sort of communities of classes. And it's not even teaching something that's incorrect, it's just teaching it in a way that's not very effective, right? So I, I see licensing sort of, to, to me, and I haven't thought about this more for more than since you asked the question, but it seems like licensing could be a better way to go, right? Where the, the permission is given, you know, at the time that the content is produced, and there are expectations about how the content is used and how changes and improvements are pushed backwards, right, and are shared with the community, right? So when you write software, you don't worry about citing things. You use somebody else's library because it has a license that you like. And then when they fix things, you also get those updates and things improve, right? So I think if we could take that model, and again, I'm a computer scientist, so I try to work everything into my own little mental framework, right? Because, um, but I think that that seems like it's more effective than a, than a scholarly citation model. Well, I, it, we can't talk about this, it seems, without veering into the, the P word, which is publishing, right, in textbook, which you guys have, you know, talked about. And so I guess that's my, uh, one of the cautionary points that I see with um, citation, right, is that are we, just as there, there are lousy textbooks that have done, you know, years of damage, <laughs> you know, do we want to copyright or, or uh, courses that aren't, you know, in three years as technologies and, and the digital literacy of students and education, you know, backgrounds of students change and who we're reaching also don't work that well. So. so in community colleges, we're really trying to encourage departments to develop courses and textbooks because um, and we use a lot of adjuncts and adjuncts are brought in often at the last minute as, as Anne was mentioning. And we've actually had one instance where a professor got sick, went on sabbatical, something, and the adjunct was brought in a few days before the course, and the professor tried to charge the adjunct to use his materials. And, and we just need a more cooperative approach. And there are some really good textbooks out there that were written by particularly the College of the Redwoods, some math textbooks. So we want to see this. And we had an interesting experiment or look at statistics in the humanities, the individual professor or instructor chooses the textbooks. In the sciences, it's more often the department. And in business, it's the college, because business professors are almost always from industry. And they come in, and they don't have time to develop material. So they take the material that the college provides. Um, also, uh, it might be really nice if a MOOC platform provided a way for contributions like uh, additional quiz questions and things like that uh, so that uh, a course could be improved over time. Uh, I don't, don't know if any of the platform... <laughs> oh, you do? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> uh, any more questions up there? So I had another one. Um, I would point out that licensing goes hand in hand with acknowledgement or citation. Uh, Creative Commons, every license requires acknowledgement. Um, but the other question was on what I think the fusion model is, which is a local group doing a MOOC in conjunction with a global group. Is that correct? Um, could you elaborate on that? Because that's a very different model than the closed instance. Um, you have the opportunity for local students to benefit from that global cohort. And I'm wondering if you could tell us about more lessons that were learned there and whether the other panelists have uh, experience in that area as well. Yeah, so, um, you know, it wasn't truly, it was global, but it was still restricted to uh, Colgate alumni in this case. The next iteration will be a little bit broader, and then we'll go 
full guns and go for the whole thing. Um, so what we learned from that, it, it was actually, it, it accomplished a lot of what we wanted. It brought in a lot of diversity of thought and opinion. Um, but that's also one of the things that we're cautious of, and actually I think it would make a great um, companion MOOC, is how do you talk about significant events in history that are very controversial in a global perspective? Because it's one thing to talk with a group of Colgate students and a group of Colgate alum about the, the events leading up to dropping the bomb in Hiroshima. But now if we have um, students in that course from Japan, what are their opinions going to be? And how do you have that conversation in a, a collegial way? I think that goes to your question about how do you, how do you control a discussion group? Because it could get very controversial. So we're still learning that and, and working with our faculty, working with our alumni base, we'll work with our friends, hopefully you all we have. But I think it'd be great to have a, a separate MOOC just to talk about that. How do you talk about controversial things when you, from a global perspective, there's very different views on that event. Um, I think it'd be great. Um, so we're uh, launching a, a MOOC in global history. Um, that, that was offered on Coursera, it helped with uh, Coursera, and now we're bringing it. Um, it's global history in the global classroom. And uh, the students on campus are gonna be in teams and they're gonna be interacting with these teams, self-formed teams of people around the world, discussing um, difficult topics, and I'm gonna take a lot of value. <laughs> And we, we've got an upcoming course on anthropology of, of current world issues, which will have very similar sorts of things. So uh, the MOOC platform provides a, a very exciting domain for, for exploring uh, cultural issues and, and geographical issues. So one of the speakers brought up this idea that, you know, when we start teaching, we just copy our advisor's syllabus and something that we have done before and so on. So one of the expectations you would have from MOOCs is, when do we stop recreating content? And what are the boundaries between just creating and recreating and actually doing something different, right? So do we see that happening? Or is it just going to be more and more content keeps getting produced without any real curation over all of the content? Um, so one thing that I've observed just from the professors that I work with is that they, you know, they enroll in all the other courses and what they've wanted to do and sometimes do do is just link to each other's content or ask, you know, now this is in, intra-institutional, right? So it's okay usually, but can I, you know, and I, I've sometimes brokered these deals, right? So does the Stanford Med course benefits from the GSB course and can we do that, something like that? So, so. I see potential for that model to move where, where, you know, you say, you know what, somebody's got the best lecture on this topic, but just that one little bit, but I want to use that one little bit, which goes to your modula modularity thing. Yeah, I think that's a, a great question, and one of the things we're interested in, some of the courses that we're looking at in the humanities, for example, Living Writers, that's new every year because it's a different, this, this year it's 10 international authors, next year it'll be 10 different authors. So it's a, it's a complete recreation each year. It's not just the same content. Um, so that's something that we want to look at. Um, and then in our core programs, we're also looking at the same thing. How do we take the best of? So we teach um, a course on antiquities. And so we have a professor who's very knowledgeable in the book of Genesis. So instead of having uh, a geologist, again, who might be teaching that course, talk about that, then we could use some of that content and do that. So we're trying to get that best of breed. But I think we do need to be realistic and to not offend any of my colleagues at Colgate. We wouldn't offer an engineering course. We don't offer engineering, so I won't offend anybody. <laughs> but because that's probably done better somewhere else. So what we look at is, what do we do at Colgate that we think we do as well, or if not better? But a very valid point. I don't know where you start to kind of figure the best of breed. And, and I know we're supposed to forget about learner styles. I, I get that. Just move on, I think was the comment, or, or let it go. Um, but perhaps there does need to be some diversity in how it's taught, because I think, you know, maybe it's not a learner style, but it, there's diversity in the way things taught, and people may pick it up differently. I wanted to add, the session that I accidentally went to is the group of people at MIT that are building this backbone with edX modules at the assessment level, the video level, the, the uh, text level, and so on, for sharing within MIT so that you're building a physics course. You can go get the best video on, on spin theory or something, and you can go get the best assessments on something else. And then they intend to share this out to the larger edX community 
I left too soon to find out if they're going to get beyond using edX um, into other platforms. We use a product called Soft Chalk, which is really popular among community colleges. And it's a content management system that can be deployed out then to Moodle or Sakai or, or NovoEd or other tools. And it's a better editor than most of the LMSs have, can do fancier things. So a content management system could really contribute a lot. But I, I also, I, mean, I think there's a dangerous word that's being thrown out up here, which is best, right? You know, I mean, the, the best lecture on this, the best explanation of this particular topic, I don't know if that exists, right? I don't know if we have any evidence that it exists, really, in, in a way that's meaningful, right? I mean, if, if best is distinguishing between the one that, you know, uh, the one that 10% of students can learn from rather than 8%, right? effectively, then maybe it doesn't matter, right? Maybe we're talking about a, a real interesting plurality rather than this idea of the best, right? So I think that, I think that, I don't know, I feel like that idea has actually just worked its way into a lot of the design of the MOOC platforms that are out there, right? Is that there's an implicit assumption that somebody, maybe we don't know where that person is or who they are, but someone gives the best explanation of this particular topic, right? And I don't know if I believe that, right? Um, and I certainly think that I haven't seen a lot of evidence that it's true, right? And so I think that, you know, and, you know, think, think about it this way. What happens when the best, you know, person to explain this topic delivers the five-minute video and the student doesn't understand it, right? What do you do then? Do you show them the best person again, right, and until they get it? Um, you know, so I think there's, there's still, even if you believe in the best, right, which again, I don't think anyone has any, have any, has any evidence for this, there's still this idea that we could still use more content. Now, I agree with you about... And it doesn't have to be a person. Content is not a person. Sure, sure, so sure. You no, are, you are, no, 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 I'm, I'm going back things. to your, yeah. I'm going to go back to your question, right? I'm just responding to some of the things the panelists said, right? But, you know, this idea that should we produce content ad infinitum, no. Right? But we really don't do that. I mean, my point was a lot of times faculty don't produce new content, right? We're essentially borrowing and, and stealing things from our advisors and other people. We probably should produce more content, but we also need to deploy content in a way that allows us to understand what we're good at producing, what's effective, what should we keep, and what can we get rid of, and what do we need to fix, right? Like, I wish I could, you know, have a tool that would just tell me, here is, you know, I'm going to teach the same class again next spring, right? I don't have enough time to rethink my conceptual approach to teaching the whole class, right? What don't I teach well, right? What are the, you know, five lectures that I should rewrite or the five pieces of various things that students aren't getting? I don't feel like I really have a tool to do that, and I think some of the modular tools that we're trying to develop would help with that as well. Sorry, I, I, I discussion on the other end. Well, I, I, I just, so one thing I say when I talk to professors, and if I were talking to you to help you design your courses, I would say, Think about it as a meal. So you're creating this house party. If it's a MOOC, it's a house party, right? You're creating an experience for the students. Now, you may want the best beer, and you may want the <laughs> best porn chips, and you may want the best burritos, but you're creating an experience. And that's the, that should be the focus, not any one little point. Yeah, I think I wanted to, to, to also answer in that a similar vein, because the, the content is the part of a MOOC that is a textbook. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's a finite eco ecosystem over which publishers have been, you know, the publishers carve out really nicely for, I don't know what, calculus textbooks. But a MOOC in calculus is not the same as a calculus text. And just the, for the same reason that there have been, I don't know, 20 textbooks in calculus and hundreds of people teaching calculus classes that are not isomorphic copies of those textbooks, I think there's room for MOOCs. And I think, you know, none of us is going to rewrite Newton. Calculus has been there for a while, but there's room for a lot of different people teaching calculus in lots of different ways. And I th so, so I think the, the MOOC, yes, there's bigger reaches. There's an issue of how many different copies of a calculus lecture do we need. But it's not, it, it's somewhere in between textbooks and, because a MOOC is an experience, and if I'm going to interact actually with a professor who's going to be writing the homework, is going to be explaining things, is going to be answering my questions, then I think it's really valuable that this is the same person that I watched sort of explain uh, variable, change of variables in an integral. 
because I formed a connection to that person through having conversation with him. I'll listen to how he changes variables differently than I'll listen to somebody I've never met. The, the, the former is like, a, is like a, a course, and the latter is just reading a textbook. And I think we can position MOOC somewhere in the middle there. Maybe we should re start removing personality from some of the MOOCs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the instructor does does tend to be a very important part. Uh, I think we're run out of time there. Um, one more, as long as it's Hi. one minute. Um, okay. <laughs> um, I just uh, just to follow up on what what was just said. I think that um, it's helpful often to think of this continuum, if you will, between uh, information, uh, data, information, and knowledge. And I think our courses sit, uh, we, we think that when students are in our classes that we're in the knowledge part, and I think that's true. Um, and I think that you could argue that the, the internet or whatever produces data, let's say, or a textbook perhaps produces information, but it's the role of the instructor to kind of weave it together and help the students create knowledge in that classroom experience. And I think there's a place for MOOCs to do that knowledge creation bit, but it's how you use the, the information or the data, wherever you want to start from, that's all. OK, I think we're going to wrap it up there. We're three minutes over. <laughs> I think we've had a, a wonderful conversation here with some really great topics. Thank you to all of the panel for their presentations and participation, and thank you. Session really. Works.